As we continue our journey to the Promised Land with the children of Israel, we come today uh, to, a, to a part of their story that was so important that God commanded Moses to put something very particular into the Ark of the Covenant that would commemorate uh, these events in their journey through the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant was this incredibly precious and special and beautifully ornate container that would sit in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, in the Temple in the years to come. And only three things made it into the Ark of the Covenant as, a, as an ongoing reminder to the people of God. The first were the two tablets of stone that contained the Ten Commandments, the law of the covenant between the Lord God and his chosen people. The second was Aaron's staff, the staff of the high priest uh, that had budded in the wilderness. And that's a whole other story that we're not going to go into uh, this morning. Uh, but this was a, a precious representation of the importance of the, the role, the calling and the role of the high priest in the things of the people of God. But the third was a strange one. It was a gold jar of bread-like wafers. I don't think anybody would argue with the, the importance of the Ten Commandments in the, the history of the people of God as a sort of a basis for his relationship, his covenant with them. And the importance of the priesthood, that not just anybody could set themselves up as a, as a priest for the living God. And that ultimately, of course, there will be one high priest for us all, the Lord Jesus himself. But why a jar of bread-like wafers? Why was this so important that it should be placed in the Ark of the Covenant as a memorial for the children of Israel? As we look at this story today, I believe that there are three things, three reasons why these wafers might serve as a really important reminder to the children of Israel. And that these three things are as relevant today as they were three and a half thousand years ago when these wafers first appeared. Of these three things, the first is that it matters that we follow God's instructions. A really simple lesson. It just matters that we follow God's instructions. Secondly, that he will provide nourishment for the journey for us, day after day, week after week, year after week, year. And thirdly, that his provision is not just for nourishment, but for rest. As the Lord gave the children of Israel this strange food they'd never seen before, uh, he also, at this point in their journey, introduced the Sabbath principle. The idea that just as God had worked for six days in the creation of the universe, that uh, this too would be a gift for his people. A day of rest from non-essential work, a day simply to stop and be and know the Lord. The Lord, the Lord would provide for the work and he would provide for the day of rest. The children of Israel had witnessed mind-blowing miracles in their journey from Egypt. There were those awesome plagues that had persuaded uh, Pharaoh to let God's people go. Uh, there was this strange thing of the people, the Egyptian people giving just sort of uh, chucking riches and, and valuables at the children of Israel as they prepare to leave Egypt. But then of course there was this, uh, the, the terrible, the uh, the, the awful thing of Pharaoh changing his mind and coming in pursuit of the children of Israel, not just to return them to captivity, but to destroy them completely. But then God turns up and puts this, this uh, cloud between Pharaoh's army and the Israelites, a cloud of darkness for the Egyptians, a cloud of fire, light and warmth for the people of God, for the Israelites. And whilst the cloud protected them, a strong wind comes from the east and blows across the Red Sea uh, that uh, uh, they basically got their, almost their backs uh, against. Uh, and as this wind blows all night, so by the morning there was a path of dry land through the sea for the Israelites to make their escape. And finally, the icing on the cake, as Pharaoh's army pursues them through this, this dry land, through the, uh, uh, the Red Sea, Moses is commanded by God to stretch out his hand uh, and, and over the sea and the water floods back and completely destroys the Egyptian army. The children of Israel have been wonderfully, miraculously rescued from Egypt and the army that was pursuing them, hell-bent on their destruction, uh, has been completely destroyed. Wow, how they celebrated, how they sang and danced uh, and, uh, and worshipped uh, the living God, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord, had well and truly rescued them. 
they were his people and he was with them. You think that witnessing such a miracle, such a mighty deliverance that the children of Israel would never be the same again. How they could ever doubt the living God. Surely he had proven his commitment to them without any shadow of a doubt. There could be no argument. But they were a little bit like me and perhaps a little bit like all of us sometimes, quick to forget God's deliverance, his blessings, his provision, even his miracles when we face yet another challenge that in our limited human minds appears to be an insurmountable problem or an immovable obstacle. We forget the God who has called us, rescued and saved us. We become focused instead on the challenge, the problem, the impossibility before us. Last week we saw the children of Israel at the bitter waters of Marah. They had travelled for three days and found no water. And then they have finally arrived at this place called Marah. And there it is, this wonderful, vast, expanse of water. And they rush towards it to drink it. Fantastic, God has provided. But the water is bitter, undrinkable. And so the grumbling and complaining starts. What are you going to do? What are we going to drink, Moses? You've got us into this mess. What are you going to do to, to sort it out? Then the miracle does happen. At the Lord's command, a piece of wood is thrown into the water and the bitterness is gone and the, and the water is sweet to drink. And so last week, water was the problem. This week, it will be food. By now, we're, almost, uh, we're about a month into the journey uh, the, for the children of Israel, a month after they left Egypt. Whatever food they brought along with them uh, when they left Egypt has all gone, has all been eaten up. Whatever they could scavenge from the wilderness around them was going to, wasn't going to be anywhere near enough to keep this, this whole nation uh, going on this incredibly long journey. What could they do? Well, grumbling had worked before at the waters of Mara. Let's have a good old moan about it. Let's give Moses and Aaron a really hard time. They got us into this mess. Again, they need to get us out of it. And so, as tummies rumble, there are murmurings and moanings. And suddenly, life in Egypt seems like it wasn't so bad after all. And uh, it all explodes into this sort of uh, angry uh, exchange between the people of Israel, the people of, uh, of God and Moses and Aaron. In Exodus 16 verse 3, this is what we read. Uh, this was the cry of the people of Israel to Moses and Aaron. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. They make Egypt suddenly sound like it was a great feast rather than a life of brick-making slavery. Was it not their crying out to God that had prompted this great deliverance in the first place? When God had called Moses to lead his people out in Exodus 3 verse 7, it says God's words, I have seen, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. This wasn't a party, this wasn't a place of feasting, this was a place of suffering, of difficulty, of hardship for the people of Israel. But, but as far as they're concerned, rather than uh, hopes of a promised land, the people are now accusing Moses and Aaron of leading them towards a certain death in this wilderness. It's interesting, isn't it, that God wasn't even mentioned in their grumbling. As far as the people are concerned, all they can see are flawed human leaders. They've come a long way since their celebration on the shores of the Red Sea a month earlier, when we read in, in uh, Exodus 14 and verse 31, when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and Moses, his servant. But now they don't even acknowledge the Lord and they've completely lost faith in Moses as their leader. They have humanised and rationalised their situation. This is now about incompetent human leadership, poor planning leading to a multitude of hungry, angry people who are going to die in the wilderness. But then God speaks. He's been there all along. He's had a plan. He is, uh, has a, a ready perfect divine provision that he's going to give this uh, wayward bunch of grumblers. And this is his message to Moses in Exodus 16 verses 4 and 5. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. 
The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. What a strange instruction. But God made clear he wanted to test the people. Would they follow his instruction? The people will need to go out every day and gather this, this bread. But on the sixth day they will gather twice as much. What's all this about? And so the next day the people go out early in the morning and find this strange, sweet, wafer-like uh, covering all over the ground. And they gather it up. And it tastes amazing. It uh, has this wonderful flaky texture uh, like fine wafers. They discover that they can do different things with it to, to kind of prepare it in different ways. And the Lord had told them to gather just enough for that day. The implication being don't try and, and gather any extra. Uh, don't try and stash some away for tomorrow or the day after that. Gather enough for today and enjoy it and use it. But of course some are concerned that the Lord might not deliver tomorrow. And so they gather a little bit extra or they, they squirrel some of the, uh, the, mat, the, uh, the food they've picked up today to save it for the next day. But the next day the leftover bread is full of maggots and smells disgusting. But there's no problem because outside once again the, the ground is covered with more of this wonderful uh, delicious substance, this food, this nourishment that God has wonderfully provided. So off they go and gather it in once again. But then on the sixth day something strange happens as they begin to gather they realise there's even more than there was before. More of this bread or manna as they've started to call it. This is remarkable. So much so that the leaders of the people go and tell Moses about it. Why is there so much today? In Exodus 16 verse 23 Moses tells them this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it till the morning. Now we're so used to the idea of the Jewish Sabbath that it's hard to imagine that there was ever a time when uh, the children of Israel treated every day like any other day uh, before God had actually instituted this idea that one day would be special, one day would be a day of rest, a day just of being the people of God. But this is the moment as God introduces this, uh, this wonderful food into their lives. He also introduces this gift of rest that one day each week they were to do no unnecessary work but simply be and enjoy uh, rest and enjoy being the people of God. And so the Israelites gathered twice as much on that day and prepared it however they wanted to, enjoyed some of it that day and saved the, next, the, the rest for the next day, this precious Sabbath day of rest. And the next day there it was, just as tasty and nourishing as it had been the day before. No maggots, no disgusting smell. And as they left their tents, they found there was none of this, this, uh, this manna, uh, this bread on the ground. Some had actually gone out to collect some uh, in, dis in, in direct sort of uh, uh, um, ignoring God's instruction that they should not uh, collect any of this manna on this special Sabbath day. Uh, and God was not pleased. And these are the words of the Lord in verses 28 and 29. How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord God has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gave you bread for two days. Just as this miracle food was a gift for the Lord to his people, this precious day of rest was a gift too, a blessing, something they needed, something that would enrich their lives. Of course it was no surprise to the Lord that some would fail this test. He wasn't testing them to find out himself whether they would pass or fail or if they would uh, trust him and obey him, or just revert to their own wisdom and their own ways. He tested them so that it would become clear to them the condition of their hearts and their need for the living God. He tested them to train them to trust him and obey him, to show them that he was indeed a faithful God, full of compassion and mercy. A God who would not lead his people into a wilderness to die, but lead them into a wilderness where they had no choice but to learn to trust their God as saviour and provider, as Lord and master. Because it was as they trusted and obeyed that they would know the blessing 
of the Lord their God in this promised land in the years to come. What can we learn from this important moment in the journey of the children of Israel to the promised land? Surely we have even more precious promises to hold on to in Jesus. These things we read of in the Old Testament are but a, a kind of a shadow of the better, greater promises that Jesus brings. What does Jesus have to say to us about following his instructions? In that beautiful passage in John's Gospel where Jesus uh, uh, first taught, teaches the disciples about the Holy Spirit, who would come and be their constant uh, helper and comforter and nourisher when Jesus had gone to be with his Father. Jesus begins with this simple direction in John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. If it was important that through their journey in the wilderness, the children of Israel learnt obedience so that they could uh, continue to know God's blessing in the promised land, is it not so much more important for the people of God, us, his children, to learn obedience in our walk with Jesus so that he can sustain us, nourish us and give us rest? Why? Because there is an even greater, a more precious promise for the believer in Jesus than just spiritual or natural food we are promised God himself by his Holy Spirit dwelling within leading guiding sustaining uh, saving changing healing the Holy Spirit is a gift to each and every person who turns to Jesus and receives this wonderful gift of salvation but if I'm to fully enjoy this gift his precious uh, his presence and his power in my life it matters that I seek to walk in obedience to Jesus, to him, just as God called the children of Israel to a walk of obedience in the wilderness in preparation for the promised land. Obedience and reverence for the written word of God. Obedience and reverence for the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, the, the whispers of the Holy Spirit uh, that uh, lead and direct us. Uh, as we as we uh, go forward in in faith and trust in him if you love me keep my commands Jesus said then goes on to give this wonderful promise in verses 16 and 17 in this book of John I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate or another helper as some translations put it to be with you forever even the spirit of truth and then Jesus repeats this call to obedience again in verse 21 Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then he repeated again in verse 23 with this amazing promise. This matters, this really matters to Jesus, this question of obedience. Does it matter to God with the children of Israel in the wilderness? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. What a precious and wonderful promise that God will dwell with the obedient, just as God promised to be with an obedient people uh, in the children of Israel. The Israelites had to learn to obey God's instructions so when they got to the promised land and the manna stopped uh, coming, they would continue to obey him as they enjoyed the abundance of this new land. In our walk with God today, Jesus is training us to depend on him day by day, to trust him fully in the nitty gritty of our daily lives and to fully enjoy his living within us, uh, within us by the Holy Spirit. And what of this thing of Sabbath rest? Where does this come into, the, into our story um, as the children of God ourselves, as the people of God? I love the call of Jesus in Matthew 11, verses 28 to, uh, to 30. He says this to the people, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This journey Jesus calls us to is a journey of sacrifice and sometimes a journey of suffering. But is it also a journey of great joy and a journey of rest? 
don't always know where he is taking us, but we can trust him to lead us as we entrust ourselves to him in obedience. And one final thought as we close today. God was amazingly patient uh, with the children of Israel as they grumbled in the wilderness. He graciously met their needs. But how much better had they prayed and laid their needs and requests before the Lord God, who had so wonderfully delivered them from, his, from uh, Egypt? A lesson for us, perhaps. Let us be, not be grumblers and complainers, but let us in prayer, uh, let us seek God and lay our requests before him. And let us not look at just at our lives from a human perspective. Whose fault is it? Who's to, who can I blame? Uh, but let us lift up our eyes to the Lord God. What are you doing in this situation, O oh God? Because ultimately my trust is in you. Like all of us, I am on this, this journey I am far from perfect in these things, but I'm grateful for the gracious, merciful work of the Holy Spirit in my life, sustaining me as I feed upon the Word of God every day, strengthening me as I enjoy the fruit of the Holy Spirit in those around me, in his precious, wonderful church. Uh, um, all of you. <laughs> he has called us in this together, uh, to offer ourselves day by day to him, to trust him and obey him. Amen. Thank you for listening.